Recording is on. All right, so today is uh, July 20, 2021, and it's part two with uh, Spencer McCall. So uh, we'll leave it off. Um, Hugh, did you want to start it off? Uh, yeah, sure. So, so yeah, let's go back to where we finished off. And uh, we, we finished off talking about can you have a benevolence or beneficial cult leader, so benign cult leader. Um, so I want to go over that. I also wanted to just mention, I did actually eventually find the Tucker Carlson spoof that you did, which oh, is yeah. absolutely priceless. <laughs> So I'll put I'll put a link to that in this uh, in this one too, um, and yeah, it was it was just wonderful how you showed up, how you know so much fun. But you actually were carried seriously in the Washington Post, was it? Yeah, oh, the story yeah. actually ran. Yeah, um, Unbelievable. It, <laughs> it was a trip. Yeah, I mean, it was really the brainchild of uh, a friend of mine uh, who you know created this this whole campaign around the idea that uh, we had heard a lot before 2016 and even before, you know, the idea of crisis actors, which uh, is, you know, just ridiculous and um, like totally untenable. But you also hear about like paid protesters. You'd hear, hear that all the time and you'd hear people like Trump claiming that there were paid protesters being bussed in. And so my friend uh, kind of just thought like, well, how, how would you actually logistically do that? Uh, how would it be possible to actually pay protesters and, and sort of did the math and he created a company called Demand Protest and uh, and then started posting on like task rabbits and Craigslist all around the country, offering these exorbitant prices uh, and travel to go to Washington DC and to go protest at the inauguration of Donald Trump but wasn't necessarily saying whether it was protesting for or against. It was just, just go there and, and make a scene. And um, by doing that, it got just immediately got tons of coverage uh, right away. Some of it actually like purported to think that it was real. Um, you know, there's very little diligence done. Um, and that was kind of on both sides of the news political spectrums. There was conservative news and uh, and liberal news both kind of for a second uh, running with it. And uh, and then my friend got uh, got an email from Tucker Carlson uh, saying, you know, we'd like to talk to you about this, uh, this company. And I have a little bit of history with understanding like how those kind of um, feeds work. So I was in L.A., uh, Tucker Carlson, I think is in Washington, DC. And so I said, <laughs> so my friend kind of just asked, uh, do you want to do this? Do you want to go on? And you can say anything you want on, uh, on Fox news tonight. And so just kind of knowing, all right, well, I'm pretty close to the, the Fox affiliate here in, in Santa Monica. Um, so if they can, you know, feed me in, then sure, I'll go do it. And, uh, Really had no idea what I was going to say, uh, but they sent like a black car and picked me up on a corner, street corner in Santa Monica and went down there and just kind of was like, okay, so <laughs> what do I want to talk about and what do I want to do? And it kind of just, you know, I think it, I just sort of wanted to talk about aliens and just kind of derail it and just kind of do a spectacle around uh, how easy it actually was to get on, you know, national primetime news. Uh, but as I kind of thought a little bit more about it, it's like, well, maybe we can actually kind of use absurdity to say something about the state of, of the world. And, and uh, yeah, so that was kind of the idea. And then, you know, went on and, you know, done a little bit of improv in the past and there's always the yes and thing. So, you know, it's never about uh, getting in an argument because obviously that's what somebody like Tucker Carlson wants is, you know, this like, Panem Circensis kind of thing of just like, let's just have a gladiator match. Um, but if you kind of like used a little bit more of like intellectual jujitsu and just kind of like everything he said, you know, yes, and we're going over in this direction, um, it was able to kind of, uh, you know, I guess sort of break him at a certain point and real, we we're kind of able to understand the absurdity of the situation and hopefully 
some of his viewers could understand the um the like absurdity of of the idea of paying protesters or crisis actors uh, i think some people got that and some people saw kind of what they wanted in it um but you know that is that is what it is <laughs> But there, there really is such a thing as you, you can rent crowds and stuff like that. I, I didn't believe it myself, but uh, in Los Angeles, the first time I came across it was in Los Angeles in about 94. And um, I just happened to go to a, um, uh, this club uh, because I knew the, the band out there. And the opening act was Alanis Morissette. Um, it was the day before her album was released. Nobody had ever heard of her. And I thought she was absolutely freaking terrible. Uh, but the whole place was alive with oh, millions of people. But there was something a little bit off. And then everybody, you know, after she'd finished her gig and went on to my friends, the whole place just cleared out. I thought, what the hell went on? And then some people <laughs> explained to me, no, they, they just paid. They, they basically, all these extras, they would be in Hollywood. The same thing happened in uh, San Francisco. I had this weird experience again and again because I worked in downtown in about uh, 2000, 2001. And, uh, you know, there were these guys who were kind of well-dressed. You'd get, say, a power couple, and they'd be sitting in a Starbucks. And they would start up this loud, weird conversation about some product or something. And, you know, it sounded so fake and stuff. And it happened again and again. Mostly I re read in the news that, yeah, it's an advertising uh, gimmick. They basically pay a couple of actors to go into a crowded place and start talking up this fake, fake dialogue. So uh, right. yeah, it, it does. That, that's, that's it's that's not all. Widely, it's widely in Africa and in Arab countries, they go around the poor areas with money and they, they get people to cheer. And it's just that's so common. It's just a way of making a living for people out there. You know, we go to cheer for the president, for a priest, for anything sure. at all. And they, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose, yeah, I, I, yeah, and, and there's also groups it's, it's like, like the know, funeral yeah. in, in North Korea, right? How, Kim Kim Jong Un's father or something or went went the millions of these paid actors to come and cry at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe that that is the thing. My thinking at the time was it was just like kind of ridiculous to think like hundreds of thousands of uh, people were being paid by George Soros or whoever to go and, um, you know, create a scene. Um, there's also the, the idea that, you know, uh, it's, I don't even want to say it because it's so stupid, but just like the idea that uh, everybody at the January 6th riot was paid for by, you know, they're all like liberals dressed up, but, you know, it's so ridiculous, but uh, that was kind of what we were going for. I'm not to. That's not to say that you can't hire large groups of people to to do things. I mean, obviously, like the Olympics, the opening ceremony is you know, ten thousand actors who you know do whatever, do some opening show. But um, I don't know. I just at the time kind of thought it was like ridiculous. Uh, and oh, oh, sure, the the insurrection is ridiculous. But but um, Donald Trump's elevator scene. Those guys were really, they were proven to be all paid. He, you know, that whole, you, know, you remember when he, he did his debut in 2016 or so, oh, he did, came he down the elevator. elevator. And did that yeah, I mean, escalator, no, elevator. Yeah. And, and all those guys, that whole crowd was paid for by the hour. I, I think that's well established now. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess this all kind of comes back to my point of over the last like four years, my, my way of thinking has been, or what I've been trying to do is get people to re-engage with reality a little bit and, um, and sort of, I don't know, like, yeah, I wouldn't do uh, what I what I did in 2016 now, I wouldn't necessarily try to obfuscate the truth or get people to question things because I think at a certain point, uh, curiosity is nice and stuff. And I think we should ask questions and be curious and, and stuff like that, but we should do it using you know the scientific method uh, opposed to just uh, believing whatever it is you want to believe. So again, my thing is like, I love the idea of 
of hoaxes and and conspiracy theories and all that stuff is really really fun. Um, but it's fun if you kind of have the context that it's not real uh, and you're kind of playing a game um, a little bit. Where, yeah, I just uh, I, I feel like we need to get back to some consensus reality before we can uh, lead people down this other path, and that's kind of been my focus the last few years. Yeah, I think consensus reality is, um, you know, part of history now. <laughs> I don't think we can. Think that. Well, yeah. But, I mean, uh, yeah, like, so you, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, you mentioned last time, you, just when we were finishing off about the yes men. And the, the yes men said that, you know, you can actually tell the truth by telling a lie. And I, I've always thought that too. I thought you could, it's kind of what theater is all about is like, through something that's not true, you can reach a greater truth than if you just spell out the truth, don't, don't you think? And so isn't that part of it? I think that's part of it, yeah. Um, I mean, the the one of the most famous Yes Men things was the Exxon Mobil where they, <laughs> or was it Dow Chemicals, where they agreed to pay back uh, millions of dollars to everybody that they had affected by pretending to be the CEO of, of one of those companies. And uh, and in effect, all that really had to happen was, you know, the real CEO had to come out and be like, no, we're not giving the money. And so it's like this chess, you know, of like we want them to basically say, no, we don't feel bad for what we've done um, and to go publicly with it. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think you can absolutely, you know, um, tell a lie to get to the truth, I guess. Um, I just don't know how to play that game right now, um, necessarily. <laughs> yeah, it's true, we're in the twilight zone. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, so does it really matter though? I mean, the, the way I see it now, I'm getting a bit uh, nihilistic, I guess, but it, I mean, I think we just need change, right? We just, doesn't matter what it is. You, we shouldn't finesse it too much. We should just basically anything that's promotes instability and change is, is good at this point, isn't it? I think so. I mean, a lot of the thing though with like, again, I'm not trying to get, be political or anything like that, but I think a lot of the reason like Donald Trump won was the idea of like, well, let's just shake things up. Let's just get crazy and like, let's see, let's just see what happens. Um, but I don't know, sometimes, Sometimes there's a good way to shake things up, and sometimes there's a bad way to shake things up. Uh, I think. Well, well, that's kind of what I'm arguing. Is 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 there a good? Isn't it just like publicity? There's no good and bad publicity at this point. We just need a shake up, don't we? I mean, it's um, you know, the the danger is business as usual, isn't it? There needs to be a change. So it's kind of like. You know, we shouldn't be too picky. We should just go <laughs> and shake things up. No matter what happens, it's got to be better than what's happening now, isn't it? Perhaps, yeah, perhaps. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think so. <laughs> uh, well, I don't well think... isn't that the Discordian? Isn't that the Discordian way, though? It's just, you know, you just need a bit of chaos. You just need a better touch of chaos. <laughs> Yeah, but I think I think that that lesson was kind of, or that way of thinking was kind of uh, appropriated by more nefarious uh, people, you know. So, for instance, your group is is trying to see how you can use the technology of uh, of Discord to get people to wake up to environmental change and climate change, but other people would want to use that technology, uh, you know, to deny climate change and, and deny it. Um, so it's, it's sort of like, it's sort of like, it's a tool, um, but it just depends on who's wielding it, I suppose. Um, are they doing it for good or are they doing it for bad? I like to think that, you know, the ARG stuff um, that we were doing back in, in the day, that was for good. That was to get people to see the magic and beauty in the world and, and, um, and think that life is worth living and seeing um, versus using the org of like QAnon to say there's a shadow cabal of, uh, you know, <laughs> whatever, a shadow cabal of Zionists with space lasers that are in control of everything and that you're powerless. My, my thing with any like, uh, you know, 
anything really is like when I'm given a bunch of information, it's like, well, what, what do you want me to do with this information? Um, you know, so, all right, if there is a, a group of terrible, evil people hiding under the surface and they're uh, eating the adrenochrome of children, what am I supposed to do with this information? Do you want me to go into a pizza parlor with a machine gun and look for a basement? Um, do you want me to, you know, I, I don't know. I just don't know what like the call to action is. And so establishing what that call to action is, is, is kind of a challenge as well, I think. Um, Cause there's going to be the fringe nutso people who go try to storm the Capitol or, you know, enter a pizza parlor with a machine gun. Um, but how do you get that call to action to be something more uh, constructive, I guess? And, and you know, I'm not an invite, I'm not a in climate scientist, but I trust them <laughs> deeply. And, uh, and it, it's funny to me, like how the language of like climate change has had to evolve over the years. Um, it's really stupid to me, uh, you know, the idea that I think in the early 2000s, maybe even the late 90s, you know, we were always hearing about the hole in the ozone layer, the hole in the ozone layer. And we don't really hear, I don't feel like we hear too much about that anymore. And I think part of that was the idea well, no, that- it was fixed. Oh. No, it was fixed. It was no, fixed. No, they, that worked. Yeah, every, everybody, it was based on CFCs in, in aerosol cans and uh, and refrigerators, you know, the coolant. But CFCs had an easy replacement. So everybody rallied all over the world and the holes started to heal up. All the, all the sheep who had damage to their eyes and in Terra del Fuego and stuff, they got better. It, it was a big amazing. success story. And, but it's turned into a disaster because all the climate scientists said, you know, we must do that again. And what then the big mistake they made was the economics because they, the CFC and the hole in those on layer had an easy fix and it was even economic. So people switched to it, but there is no substitute for oil and green tech and stuff isn't really a substitute. It's all, a, you know, it's a bit of a con game, but, but so, because climate scientists did the same trick and said, we must keep everybody positive, we must think, and then we will do this big transition. And the transition happened, but it was from like coal to <clears throat> LNG, liquid natural gas. It wasn't really into anything sustainable. It would reduce carbon a little bit, but the economy expanded. So it turned out that it, they used the wrong model. It was, uh, it was the wrong thing to do to try and re re replicate that. Got it. So I see this, this is something I didn't even know that like the hole in the ozone layer was, was fixed. And I, I think we need to uh, do a little bit more of that of, of like, you know, singing our own praises a little bit when we do kind of tackle something and, and successfully try to fix it. Um, because there's, there's definitely a sense I think of like this, like uh, hopelessness and what is it that we can possibly do uh, there's nothing we can do, so we might as well just write it out until we, whatever happens, until we all, you know, die or whatever. But I, I love the idea that, no, like, there's stuff we could do if we invest in in certain technologies, we can we can fix this. Um, and I don't know, I think we should sing our own No, no I don't think we can. No, I don't think we can. I think that that's the big con going on is they're trying to convince us that if we, you know, it's just a question of investing in this and that. And I don't think that holds up. I, I think that, that we, we have to basically scale back. We have to do degrowth. We have to like rediscover ourselves. And, and so it's really industrialism that's the problem. So what yeah. they're doing with all the green tech solutions is they're trying to fake us out and say, no, no, given, you know, this industrial system that hardly anybody ever likes, Give it a second chance and everybody goes yeah let's make good you know solar panels and and wind farms and we'll all be fine it's like no we won't it's 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 fantasy they're basically that all those things will be added to the energy budget but they're going to increase coal they're going to increase you know fossil fuel usage is going to expand to 2050 the iea is not even hiding it um it's going to expand dramatically almost uh 50 increase um and and so they'll just add all the the green 
so-called renewables, they'll just add it to the energy budget and we'll just have more energy to do more planetary destruction. So what we really need to do is to, you know, get people off this this culture of, uh, you know, that no one, no one really likes it even. Uh, and so I think that the way to do it with an ARG is, okay, the, it, it's the same thing as, as you did with the Institute. You basically have some good guys and bad guys, even if it's really spurious. <laughs> you just need a, a, you know, controlled opposition, preferably, but some kind of opposition, and you need some, some kind of dichotomy like that just to make it work, just like theater. But then I think it's a question then of who's got the best narrative. And so if people are, are doing these kind of psyops like QAnon and stuff like that, uh, that's one narrative and it's not very appealing. It's, it's like you say, it's all a bit dark, a bit negative, it's all a bit wacky. Um, and, you know, adrenochrome and stuff, it's not, it, it's, it's not very uplifting and stuff. So it's an easy narrative to beat. Uh, then you take the the green tech narrative and then it's all like, hey, you know, we can, well, it, it's the transhumanists that I think of the, the green tech guys. So it's all like, you know, it's Elon Musk and Bezos and Gates and stuff, and we're all going to apply tech and live happily ever after with, you know, all this uh, technology is going to save us and AI is going to be our friend and, you know, we're all going to be cyborgs and it's going to be wonderful and we'll colonize Mars. And it's like, that also sucks. <laughs> for my, you know, for the unless uh, you and adolescent that grew up on Star Trek, I, I think that can I jump you a second there, Hugh? How are you going to make a narrative appealing for degrowth um, in people who will engage in an arg who are who think that technology is going to is going to sort out everything to their slightest little daily problems to their health to their phone to everything it that is that is my for us I, we've got narratives we we are from another generation we know what's appealing to us uh, i mean we live kind of self-sufficient but to make a, a narrative appealing is going to be the big crucial thing you know i mean the planet elsewhere and the planet nowhere that the, that you had started when you were for us it's fine but when we think that we're going to we're going to be talking to people who are so in love with their tech, how are we going to make it appealing? Easy as falling off a log. Okay, Spencer, okay. Um, now we need your help on this one. But this <laughs> is the way I see it. It's dead easy. It's the oldest narrative in the book. Is You just get people to believe that all those guys are really necromancers. They're all romancing death. That whole world, the upload to silicon, all this kind of cyber thing, it's a dead, dead, dead world. The, the virtual reality. The, you know, the, if you go into those kind of virtual reality simulators, those full immersion ones like the Matrix, the thing that strikes me most about them is the experience is dead. It's lifeless. It's like a mausoleum. Those guys are really like death eaters. And it's easy to make it say that, you know, it's, it's, it's bleak, it's deadly, it's not like, so it's basically easy. We're team life. We're all about, we are trying to save life. These guys are going to create death. You know, they, they're all trying to get to immortality, but even, I'm even reading Homo Deus now by, by Harari. Mm -hmm. And I, I just started it, but I think he's going to the same place. He's saying that these guys in their quest for immortality are going to kill us. And then, well, that's the oldest story in the book. It's choose life, and these guys are death. And then everything about us is life. We're team human, and so it's all about reestablishing humanity, reestablishing all the stuff that makes us human. It's rediscovery. It's, um, I, I think we win hands down. What, okay, so now what do you think of this, uh, Spencer? Well, um, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I, I know... And you, you'll, you'll maybe get it a little bit when you watch like in Bright Axiom. But one of the things that was really, really powerful and it wasn't wrong. It wasn't I don't think it was I think it was true. But one of the things the first things that happened, you know, that got people involved. Uh, so basically the way that we or Jeff really uh, crafted the idea around getting people invested emotionally in something, uh, whether it was the Latitude Society or the, the principles that were, that were underlining it. Um, 
the whole we can talk about the business model later but the whole idea was essentially that um you were special you were chosen you were you are the one that we need uh you've been identified by somebody that you know and you are the only one that can maybe you are the only one of a group of people who can bring about change um and so this was done by kind of this pay it forward model so what you would do is you would get called to a cafe uh, and a friend would say, hey, I have a secret, uh, or can you keep a secret? Uh, I want to invite you into something, um, but you can't tell anybody. You have to, you know, keep it very, very... Total you know, discretion, right? Total discretion. Was absolute discretion, <laughs> yeah. Which, funny enough, can... The idea around absolute discretion has multiple meanings. It just, you know, can you, can you make a good decision? Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean secrecy, although for most people it, it could or did. Um, or it just means, you know, absolutely owning the decisions that you make, um, you know, and and not backing down. But anyway, yeah, so you would be basically gifted an invitation into this society by somebody you already knew and somebody who knew you. And if they were identifying you and they knew you, they knew that you were special and important enough to be invited into this society. So it's kind of like that. Um, you know, I guess like Neo from the Matrix or or Luke Skywalker. It's like you are the chosen one, um, and we need you. Um, and you're more important than you think. Um, sometimes maybe that's in uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know, in Joseph Campbell stuff. It's like maybe that's a lineage thing. Your father was Zeus. And so you are Hercules, but you've been forgotten and you need to like reclaim the greatness that is you or whatever. Um, so, I mean, the problem then becomes when you, when you make somebody feel like they are very, very special and important, then uh, a kind of entitlement, I guess, shows up and in a rightful entitlement i don't mean that necessarily in a bad way but it's like you can't give uh luke skywalker the lightsaber and then take it out of his hands and say oh no it doesn't actually belong to you so once you give somebody that power uh you know there's there's definitely there's definitely a lot of responsibility that that comes both for them and the person who gave that to them um so, I mean, how do you get somebody super involved and in, into something? I mean, that's, there's a, there's a million ways, but also like, you know, only a couple. And, uh, and I don't have like just a clear one definitive answer to, to anything like that. But that's something that we kind of thought a, a fair amount about. So, yeah, isn't the way to do it... Um by an initiation and the degrees, like Freemasonry. So, you know, you don't say to people, oh, you Luke Skywalker, or you are the chosen one. It's basically, that's that's a very old, old archetype. It's, you know, Arthur and the stone, you know. So, right. you know, so you don't, they don't draw the sword from the stone, or they don't get Excalibur or anything like that. So they, they have to earn it. So, the, you know, the, the narrative is something like, um, you know, when you were born or you might you know you can always implant a memory in people you say do you remember when you were a little kid and you had this amazing experience and says so that was the aliens we came down and we basically altered you genetically so now you are susceptible to basically this program so we, we basically inoculate or if you felt you a little bit different throughout your life that's part of the price you had to pay for being special with this uh, genetic manipulation and now we complete the genetic therapies to transform you into like a human, full human butterfly. Yeah. So you, you, you say, oh, it's, all, it's done by degrees. And then each thing unlocks this uh, potential inside you. Well, that's, you, that sounds a little like Scientology. Uh, <laughs> like it does, yes, but they, they did it for a reason, right? It works. It's, it's an old formula. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was able to read through a little bit of the the document that you sent over, and and I was pretty interested in kind of like, uh, and we were talking about it earlier, or about to start talking about it. The the idea of like the benevolent 
cult leader um, and like how you how you create that and what that means um, because just just a word of warning here just so we don't have to do too much editing later uh, the code word for that guy in the document is faulty okay so just use the word faulty <laughs> okay go, go carry on <laughs> sure you know, like basil faulty from yeah, faulty time. oh right right right, right. <laughs> yeah um yeah i i don't know i'm really interested in that i don't know like do you need to have i don't know do you need to have a central like figure uh that people rally around it, it goes back to like kind of having the uh I don't know if you want me to use the word cult or, or not, but like the idea of a cult of personality yeah, yeah, versus, versus kind yeah. of like culture, I guess, and letting things kind of grow on their own um, and having like decentralized I leadership. Think, you see, I, well, a couple of things. One of them is this is a left wing project, right? So the left is continually plagued by this, you know, really, um, analysis paralysis and decision paralysis because they always think you have to have consensus it's just a thing it's just part of the left and they're like well no i mean in these kind of situations which are really kind of like wartime situations you just have to suspend democracy and say look we've got to constitute ourselves like an army and have a general just so we can compete with the other guys who are actually regimented so it's, I think that there needs to be a concession on that thing. So, so it's just temporarily you need a commander in chief. So then, then uh, the egregore builds around that. So everybody's in charge of building the egregore, but the way I see it is kind of like the um, faulty or the, the cult leader would, is in this back and forth, they're in this dialogue and it's really a dialectic and the egregore emerges because basically the players in the game and the chief puppet master or cult leader, they're playing off each other. So the cult leader is not really directing them or controlling them as really completing their desires. So they're reflecting their desires back to him. And then he, he basically tries a new bit of improv and then, you know, does a bit of AB testing on this way, that way. And then they say, yeah, we want more Andy Cow. So it's basically playing to the crowd. And then you get this psychological damage, uh, game that's kind of like a folie a deux in psychology, right? Um, and they play off each other. I mean, it's it's straight out of, you know, Nuremberg, <laughs> right? That's what was going on at Nuremberg. And that's what every demagogue does. But I think that's that's really what you have to do. There's, there's a little element here of self-awareness. So the mere fact you say this is a cult, you say that this is what you, you kind of open that this is what, what is happening. And then that kind of inoculates, the, it takes the danger out of it, so it doesn't turn into a Nuremberg. Here's my insight. All the way down the line, I've had this insight, uh, and I think it's a really important one, particularly with atheists against religion and stuff. And it's my take on religion these days. And that's that there's a placebo effect. So... I read this paper about placebos. So for the longest time, doctors thought that placebos worked because they tricked people into believing such and such. They eventually, somebody questions it because placebos are so damned effective in pharmaceutical areas. So people started to see why are placebos so damn effective? And one of the studies said, like, they told the people, look, it's just a placebo. It made no difference. The fact that the doctor gave it, it's incredible. They knew it was a trick in a manner. And so when I realized that, I started to realize, hey, this is really powerful shit. You know, it's not like if you go against religion and stuff like the humanists and stuff or you know, Dawkins and the crowd, they're going against these religious people. And you say, no. And the religious people are, are resisting it. You say, no, you can have your cake and eat it. You can go to church. You can pray to Jesus and everything. But then the you know, the priest stands up on the stand and says, but we all know there's no God and this is bullshit. <laughs> anyway, praise be to the Lord. And you don't need to, you don't have to believe it. You can also agree that we atheists and you carry on going to church. And then it's kind of safe. It's basically the placebo that you know is a placebo. Okay, there's a long story, but anyway, it comes down to the cult too. 
You say that it's a cult, but not a cult. You say that basically, you know, you, you're quite open that that's the leader is playing off the crowd and we're seeing where this is going. Everybody's in on the gag. And that's the safety. That's the safety net. That's the inoculation against the harmful stuff. That's, that's my vision. Sure. Although I, I would go even further and say that, uh, you know, with religion, because in Bright Axiom is very much sort of about like accidentally stumbling upon creating this sort of uh, theology. Um, and the idea was, you know, this isn't real. You, you should know going in, this isn't real. And yet, exactly like you're saying, it still started having the same effect as like religion does. Uh, but I wouldn't discount the actual true uh, side effect benefits of like religion, like you were saying. So um, good example. I mean, it, it could be something as simple as uh, if you go to church every Sunday, um, maybe that that's one hour where you're not um, waking up in the morning and uh, doing something self-destructive, maybe, I don't know, maybe substance abuse, or, or maybe just like you, you don't eat that sandwich. And so you're losing a little bit of weight by like having this, this goal, this thing that you have to do, or, um, or even just the idea of being around other people and physically, you know, um, it's weird to say now, but like, you know, sharing bacteria and spit, it increases your immune system. Um, I, I don't know. So what, what the latitude did was kind of really used a lot of that technology of religion of ritual congregation um and uh tradition and those things i think are just incredibly powerful even if you know the story was just you know invented uh, just a second ago it's it's that idea of of being together and so that's kind of one of the one of the things that i i think is really important to do is maybe like right off the bat, just establish what are our customs? What are our traditions uh, of this organization? Um, do we, you know, do we take a sip of wine and, and do we walk down the aisle? Like, you know, do we have the incense and all those smells trigger something that I think is really powerful and, and, and well, well, the thing is just right a lot. You just raid the, raid everything. You just raid, you basically culturally appropriate whatever's cool. You chuck in the mix, right? Right. <laughs> you just, just just a total plagiarist. Um, and you see, I'm talking to this guy uh, called Ramsey Jukes. Lionel uh, Snell is his real name. He's he's uh, a magician. He was um, he's quite well known in chaos magic uh, circles. Written books and and stuff and. So he's, he's a popular figure in the niche. Now, he did a video on how to start a cult, and I did one too, just at the same, same time. So, so I talked to him on a very fascinating discussion. But now in his video about how to start a cult, he had this experience where he went to a magician's thing, and they asked him to do something really powerful for the audience. And he did two things. One of them was he did like a Southern Baptist preacher. And he said, like, I want you to feel the chaos, brothers. And, you know, he did the feeling on the hands. And, and the whole room was complete skeptics. But they all got into it. And he said afterwards, people came uh, and said, that was the most powerful thing they've ever experienced. And it was a spoof. But he did the same thing as like a Southern pre Baptist preacher. And you can do, you know, you can immediately don, you know, the, the ochre robes and do the orange towel and suddenly you're the, the guru with the beard from India and you're the, the Indian mystic and you can switch one to the other. I think it would be a riot, <laughs> you know, especially if everybody knew that you were doing it. You know, you're just playing these, these roles. Well, yeah, I mean, but then there's also there's also a couple situations where, uh, you know, even if it's a placebo and you don't tell people uh, the effect can still be, can probably be even more powerful, but then there's also some people who become very, very upset. So a friend of mine, Brian Carmel, made a documentary called Kumare. Um, and a uh, great documentary, you should check it out. But um, it's basically the story of a friend of his named Vikram Gandhi, who, uh, Indian guy uh, or Indian descent, and um, basically uh, pretended to be a guru uh, from India and went to Arizona and put out these uh, 
posts in, in newspapers saying free yoga lessons. And so people go, okay, he, he didn't know yoga at all, <laughs> um, but people would show up and he'd start, you know, putting out these platitudes, these spiritual platitudes. And all the people that came suddenly were like, oh my God, this has like changed me completely. And their lives really do start getting better, even though he's really just saying nonsense. Uh, he has no background in knowing <laughs> any of this. It's just pure nonsense. Um, and then finally at the end, you know, I won't, won't ruin it, but it's, it's really powerful. Even you can give people complete nonsense, uh, but the idea that they believe they're learning uh, is powerful enough to enact like real change in their lives. So I've seen it. It's, it's very good. It actually made me think of a, of a character in one of the young people's series that my family were watching uh, the umbrella academy i think it was something like that where there was a guy like that who was just total just decide everybody started to follow him as a guru it's just it was even in spite of himself and people adored him and and i saw kumari it is absolutely a learning, a learning very interesting but hang, hang on a minute here didn't you see the thing from lionel snow because I think that was the guy he was talking yes, about. I'm not that's sure that's who it was. About. That's what he, he talked. He said he talked about it because he watched it on on Netflix or something. And he, he, he it's in the first video that he made on cults. That's the example he took. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, well, I have to pull Spencer in now. So Spencer, so the, 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 Lionel Snow, I was talking about here, doing this thing with his experience. He said he was a fake guru, and so. Um, uh, yeah, so this, the guy that you're talking about in the movie here, he called him up and he said, like, he said, uh, you know, you can't fake being a guru. I know because I was a fake guru and, um, and, and, and he, he talked to, to Lionel and said, what, what he found in the end was that the people were really, when he came out and he said, look, I've just been having you on, this is this is just a big spoof. I'm just basically such a barren kind of the of the cult leaders. Um, they were furious because they said, you know, because they were losing him. They said it meant so much to them what he had done. So they were they were furious that he was stopping. So he found that he was trapped into that role. Actually, I really would love it if you'd finish reading that document because I kind of hinted that to Faulty. I said that, you know, if you take this role on, you're not going to get out of it because once you mount that tiger, people don't want you to let go. You have to carry on yeah. going. This, this, it's very easy to back out of this role. So whoever whoever does it, and I'm, I'm pretty sure Faulty's tailor-made for this role, is I think I think has to go, go all the way through to the end, which is probably a grisly end for the cult leader. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm also there's there's also times and like little environments uh, that you can potentially find yourself in where uh, you've just found a group of very you know vulnerable people who are begging for some kind of guidance in their life uh, or just were neglected. And a lot of times, these people can be totally taken advantage of. With the case of like you know the Manson family, you know people. They, these were people who would have followed it you know, a duck into a lake. Um, but I, I, I also think though, like, uh, I, I'm reminded of life of Brian, you know, uh, the scene where, um, <laughs> Absolutely. he gets up and he just starts saying, you know, don't follow me. Like I'm not a leader. And they're like, Oh, the leader is so humble. And, uh, and, it, and it's like, there are these times where there are people who just are desperate to follow oh, anything, yeah. you know? No, Forrest Gump. There was also Forrest Gump, right? Um, everybody was for, uh, was he was jogging around the. Oh, around exactly, the exactly. It's like, why are you doing it? There is no, I don't know. <laughs> just that. Why are you doing this? Is this do your own jogging? They went like, oh, you know what a brilliant leader. Do your own jogging. Oh, he's so wise. <laughs> it's like his complete life of Brian. Thing. Completely, completely. Um, so. I don't know. Sometimes those those moments and those people are just kind of in in the zeitgeist. But um, definitely, there's a lot of people who I think everybody kind of wants to believe in some kind of higher higher thing. I mean, for me, uh, I'm just kind of a sci-fi nut. So uh, my my hope uh, and 
you know, every, there's some people who are like, okay, well, hopefully in my lifetime, Jesus comes back. We get, you know, the second coming of Jesus. Uh, my thing is like in, in my lifetime, I hope we actually officially make contact with aliens. Uh, like they actually come and, and hang out. So, you know, a month ago, they were going to release the Pentagon paper on the UFOs. And, and it's nice that they did that, but they, you know, they did it in true Pentagon fashion where they don't really say anything, you know, it's like, there's some stuff floating around. It could be a balloon, it could be a bird. We don't know. Um, so I, I think it's really important that you, you give everybody something to look forward to some end goal. Um, and yeah, I don't know with, with, I guess the Institute, it was, you know, bring down Octavio Coleman, bring down the, the cult leader, and then the world will return to some kind of stasis balance or something like that. But um, yeah, so, I mean, where, where are you? So, so I have a... I'll go ahead. Oh, uh, no, 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 after you. Uh, yes, so so we we have uh, all of that in place. I don't want to share it with you now because it's too much of a reveal in the story. But I, I, we got a dynamite um, version of that. It's basically you know the, that there is a route to to escape uh, to a better world. The the I mean I think that is part of a doomsday cult is you have to uh, offer a path to salvation for the chosen few. And so, you know, the way the way I structured it was the, there are twelve gold tickets that you know basically, and and the aliens. So you get the aliens straight out. But you see, the the premise um, is a good one to say, look, the aliens are not going to come down and rescue you because you've screwed up this planet so badly. You kind of like the virus of this planet. And we, we're going to come down and rescue you like we're going to come down and res rescue smallpox. It's like you're the smallpox of this planet. <laughs> if we rescue anything, it'll be the planet. <laughs> we'll get rid of you bastards. And, but with the caveat that like you're a special kind of smallpox. So you know you, you can be redeemed. But you, you first have to prove that you are not just the destructive virus that kills us host. And so it's basically you 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 can elevate yourself and, and reach the escape route, but only if you basically save it save yourself first, you know, save save your home planet first and prove that you are capable of being benign. Otherwise, you know, humans are just gonna infect the whole galaxy and just bring down all life forms if if the aliens let let us escape. When when we're obviously so destructive, we just basically going like a bushfire through the whole world. And so and so I, I think it makes a lot of sense because there's in the zeitgeist today, everybody feels there's a time of change. You know, everybody thinks that we're in the transition to something. So you get, you know, transsexuals, transhumans, transpersonal psychiatrists. So everybody's got some trans thing in it. Everybody's, you know, it seems like we're ripe for change. Everybody knows that we can't carry on in this way. And what we're kind of competing for is, is the mode of the change. My feeling is, ah, you shouldn't lose any sleep on it. You just, just basically get the birth done and have the change and you trust human ingenuity to sort out what comes next. I have total faith in humans to sort it out later. Most people think, you know, ah, we have to engineer what the future is. Oh, no, sort that out. It, humans are good at that. So, so we just need to basically do this birthing process and, and do the change. And so, yeah, that's the, and I think it, it's so, so it resonates so well with the public now because everybody feels that they can, you know, if, if you say this is how the change happens and don't get into the details too much of, of where you end up afterwards, other than a whole new game. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I also think, and, and what I was going to say was just, I'd love to maybe offline is just kind of learn a little bit more about, you know, what it is you guys are, are planning and creating and, and what that narrative is and what that execution is. I, I'd be fascinated. Um, but at the end of the day, I think another thing is, is, uh, you know, fighting climate change and trying to do something about it is actually a very like uh, human centric and kind of selfish endeavor uh, in that I don't really have any doubt that the planet earth will be able to bounce back and be okay. It just depends on how many human beings it 
it has to kill and destroy to get to that point, you know? Um, there's obviously the idea that one day Earth can become Mars, but it's not really looking like Mars dried up because of human beings necessarily, although who knows? Um, there's always that possibility for Earth, but I mean, my I think the biggest reason is if you if you love human beings, uh, then you need to help fight to keep them around and alive because I don't know, yeah, temperatures go up just too much and we get yeah, but to, to fight. yeah, but but to to keep humans around, you have to keep human habitat around. The the foundation of our existence is is the ocean, really. Right. And so you've got you've got to at minimum have a healthy ocean, and if you don't have that, you've got no humans. So you've got to start with with the animals and the ecology first, and then you know you've got to save them. You can't save them; you won't save the humans. But so my thinking on it is is I don't think we're in a position where you know you often hear this. You hear uh, with the planet of the humans and Michael Moore and that, and he said the same thing as as you that you know, oh, it's the planet's going to be fine. It's you know, it's us that's in trouble. I don't think so. I, I think that what's likely to happen now is is very very dangerous. And the the transhumanists, all the tech geeks, the billionaires, the weaponized philanthropists, all of these guys, I think what where they're heading for and very rapidly is uh, geoengineering. Now, the problem with geoengineering is not that it won't work. It's the problem is it will work. They will get the temperature down by one degree. We will get control of the weather. But you, you know what's going to happen after that is they're going to say, well, we've got control of the weather. Might as well party till we drop. Just burn every bit of fossil right. fuel. We, we can go up to 1,800 1, parts per million. And then you know how hubristic it is for us to control the weather. It's basically... We're going to fight over the thermostat. It's going to be, we're going to go from like having a th global thermostat so we can, you know, save the planet to, hey, we can actually enhance the planet. In fact, why not enhance America? We can set the global temperature so that America maximizes its crops and China goes into a desert. And you know they're going to do that. They're going to start fighting over this. You go from saving the planet to, hey, there's an advantage very quickly and then you you know at the end of that is we're going to drop the ball and then during a nuclear war or something we won't be able to do cloud seeding or solar radiation management and during that time the 1800 parts per million is going to going to make us fry so so you know we're heading for disaster and the 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 i think that they're going to try and uh control climate change and i think they're going to be successful and it'll be a disaster because we just we, we have no self-restraint, basically. So so that's part of the narrative of an ARG, is to say that we, we're against the transhumanists, these guys doing tech solutions for psychological problems and stuff, and we say mm -hmm. we have to rediscover our humanity, not try and put a technical band-aid on really what amounts to our psychological immaturity. So that's that's part of it. So just team human means discovering what it means to be human. And and then it, then you naturally you have your your Octavian um, there because you know Bill Gates, Klaus Schwab, the Great Reset. The, these guys are Octavian. <laughs> yeah. right. right. Well, yeah, but I guess maybe the the dark version of that is the same people who would be very anti-vaccination, you know, just saying we are human beings. We don't need technology to solve problems for us. Um, I have an immune system. I'm fine. Uh, I'm healthy. I don't need a vaccine. Um, but I do think that sometimes there is uses of technology that, uh, I don't know, are necessary, I guess. Um, Yes, I don't know. I don't may, know. may I come in there? You see, why the vaccine came in, and I'm, I'm a doctor, I've got a background in medicine, and why the vaccine came in is to because the health systems were overwhelmed. Right. Because they're, they're already corrupt and they're already falling apart in most Western countries anyway. Right. But when that came, it was about to collapse. So this vaccine was introduced only for that. And I mean... It's a, it's you can look at all the all the studies. That vaccine has been done in ten months instead of ten years with the normal trials on animals. It's been introduced 
just for economical and political reasons. I'm not, I'm saying like you, yeah, it has saved some old people from dying alone in hospital. It has saved the hospitals from collapsing. It has probably saved the lives of a fragile people, but the, the spreading of the indication of vaccination to, to young people and children is extremely uh, controversial. Uh, and it's it's become a you know so you're threading on on a on a uh, you have to see the premises of the technology. Why was that technology introduced? If we had stayed, yeah, well, if, if, if the economy, if if we were not thinking about the economy, if everybody stayed at home and was in total lockdown without any government saying to do it, you know, and and okay, the economy would collapse. That's so much better for the climate. Well, the the virus wouldn't find any more vectors. And it would have died out, like all pandemics do if people stop traveling and moving around and going to supermarkets. So, you know, it's not being anti yeah, the, the technology. Mm. Yeah, the, the technology always turns out to be like a double-edged sword. So we wouldn't have this pandemic if it wasn't for planes and planes kept on flying and stuff. It wouldn't have been a global pandemic if we had like sailing ships because <laughs> it wouldn't have been able to get around. That's so true. because we have this modern infrastructure and all of this stuff, then, you know, you know, it's, it's kind of like you, you wouldn't have the vaccine debate if we didn't have um, modern, modern industrial society and this huge infrastructure, global infrastructure and global trade. So it's like you, you got to at some stage ask, is it really doing anything for anybody? Is it, is it, is everybody, you know, for a few, they make an app like bandits, but for the majority of people, and, and I mean, outside of America and stuff, if you go to Africa and India and that, they just want the pain to stop. <laughs> you know, they're under so much pressure. It, it, you know, people like Vand Vandana Shiva and stuff in, in India, and, and you know, they, we, we really like our tech, and so it's easy for us, uh, you know, because we benefit from it to say that it's all great. But like Vandana Shiva was saying, um, that you know, if the global industrial system ended tomorrow, everybody in the developing world would be better off instantly, because they'd get their land back from the Coca-Cola factory that's <laughs> taken all their water and <laughs> all of that stuff. They would get instant relief, and and so so we are kind of riding high on you know our own, our own trip here, you know. So yeah, I thought. Yeah, so I'm, 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 I think that we, we need to backpedal. You've gone too far. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, you, what, what would the effect of, of shutting, so like shutting down industrialization and what would the effect might be great for people in the first world? What would the effect be on people in, in third world countries? You know, I, I, would it be better? Would it be worse? Uh, no, no, that's what I mean. Is the, you know, that's what I was saying, what Vandana Shiva was saying. She, she's an activist in India. So she was saying that, that the first world people would suffer, but the, the rest of the world, I mean, oh, the vast I majority of the world, would get instant relief. The, they, you see, I think Westerners are a bit confused on that point. They think, you know, oh, these poor people in the South and, you know, they, you know, we've got to give them electricity and medicine and stuff. And I said, no, nah, it's the opposite. It's like if you pulled the plug on the grid in America and China, uh, the rest of the world would get instant relief. And it's, it's the opposite of what most privileged Westerners think. We want to be able to go, you know, uh, we want to be able to go get our McDonald's and have it be uh, available right away or get our Amazon packages. So, yeah, I think that that's very true. Um, I mean, that's the other thing, too, is just like the amount of I, there was this kind of this thing where uh, right during the beginning of the pandemic, when everybody was staying home, everybody was saying, oh, look, uh, L.A., look, it's it's so clear, like the sky is so blue all of a sudden. And I don't for me personally, I didn't actually notice that. Maybe it's true. Uh, <laughs> I didn't really notice it. But what I did notice was the insane amount of plastic crap that was coming in all of our food delivery now, um, the insane amount of just plastic based masks being uh, 
thrown to the wind, uh, just floating out. And then I'm by the beach, see them floating in the ocean. Um, and then the amount of just uh, constant Amazon planes and FedEx planes just having to send everything now because you can't go out and get it. Um, so I personally kind of feel like staying home, at least early on, I, I just don't see how that was good for the environment with the amount of garbage that was just piling up in all our homes between packaging and the plastic forks and and just I, I don't know. I, I there were slightly but, less cars on the road for sure, but it still seems Yeah. Rude. No, no, it's a, it's a it's a very mixed bag because like that Amazon packaging that's made from the boxes are made from virgin wood. So it was terrible de deforestation and stuff. So from from an, if you go to like a website like Mongo Bay where they're environmentalists, it, it, it was a disaster. But you see, here, me in, in Greece here, I saw a dramatic recovery in the ocean because, you know, I'm diving almost every day and stuff and swimming with the fishes. And so it's uh, the, because effectively the tourists didn't come last year, uh, the, the oceans here is severely overfished. Um, you know, I, I saw a dolphin uh, a couple of weeks ago, but uh, the dolphins are kind of less and less. Uh, you know, you used to see them every day in the 70s, pods of them, 100 of them. Now, because the restaurants weren't open, the fishermen couldn't sell their fish, so they didn't go out. The fish, I saw the fish get bigger and bigger and more numerous and everything, and then they were, you know, get, I went and got a spear gun because they started to get big dinner plate fish around places which before had nothing. And so I saw dramatic recovery um, and, you know, urchins and all this stuff. Now the tourists have come back in, in a big wave. That in, in a few weeks, they've taken everything that grew back. So it's kind of heart rending. Yeah, but, my, uh, uh, it's, my it's brother is bad. actually yeah. in Greece right now. Yeah, vacationing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, which, uh, whereabouts? Um, he was just uh, at the Acropolis. Uh, he's go island hopping, so I'm not really sure at the moment uh, where he is. Uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah Kiniko? Do you know where that is? I don't know. Um, yeah, but yeah, but anyway, I mean, it's just to your point. Yeah, he's in the Aegean well, 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 I'm in the Ionian. Do you know what I was referring to about staying at home? It's not staying at home with the idea that you had to get your fix of of Amazon deliveries and and food brought to you in takeaway things. It's a, it was another another idea I had behind is that it was to, to, to stop this pandemic. The only way was to get organized locally and with a community and keep the small shops open and the small restaurants open and, and that people stop traveling. And that would have not had the impact that you saw in a big city. I'm living in the country. Hugh is living on a boat. I live in a in a village where there's seven people. Do you know, and there's more animals and birds than people in in the whole uh, uh, around the seven miles around me. But in a city, it's it's a catastrophe. I agree with you. Uh, it's a catastrophe to shut down everything. It's 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 true. But it's uh, that's the story of cities, and that's what we want to approach to in our project. Uh, it's it's part of it. The industrial the industrial problem is is a city. It's an urban problem. Why you know the dependence on agriculture, the the, the need to the, the energy problems. It's uh, so the urban thing. But again, an arg is going to be centered on an urban population, isn't it, Hugh? Yeah, but the idea is to change people's mentality. So the the I mean, you know, so that they think differently in an in something like a lockdown. Because ideally, the way they should have been thinking, say our grandparents would have thought, is they would have started instead of just thinking, oh shit, now I have to order in pizza and you know make Bezos rich by getting stuff from Amazon. They, they would have uh, started victory gardens. They would have started preparing. They would have started local things. They would have started basically localizing everything. So, um, you know, I think the government made a mistake because they should have grounded planes and, uh, and f forced people to start improvising and localizing. I think we'd all be better off. But I, I, my, I mean, I'm a doom. I think that, that we're heading for a big crisis and collapse. So I would like to... You know, educate people and try and get them to think differently so that they're more resilient. That's a kind of prepping thing as well as kind of built into, into the project.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I'd love to learn more offline about, you know, uh, <laughs> what you're, what you guys are planning and what you're doing. Cause it sounds fascinating. And I think your intentions are really great. Well, well, let us, uh, we'll let you know how we go with faulty, but I, I would urge you to read the rest of the document because one of the things that has in it is how to fund it. And I always thought funding was the biggest problem. And I think that's what you guys found as well in Bright Action or the Latitude Society. And, and so I think I've cracked the way of making the, the ARG self-funding. And, and I put the gist of it in, in that document. So, um, yeah, yeah. I think that you would be you would understand the funding part of it, but Faulty didn't. He kind of completely downplayed it. You know, funding's you know going. We got to go fund me or something. <laughs> some so have an have an auction or something. You know, it's like so. I thought that that was the major problem, and it's going to be a, a problem for activists in in the future is how to fund stuff, especially if the government decides they don't like this kind of thing. Well, my, um, my so word, yeah, so. Have a look at that document if you if you get a chance. Yeah, yeah, I've been been slammed, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I mean, my only advice there, just based on the latitude, was uh, if you're planning to ask your participants for money, do it up front. Don't do it down the line. Um, they don't like that. No, the, the idea is to fund it with a fake money, with you know, right, kind right. of a Chuck E. Cheese model. Basically, you, you you have a token tokens that you you win in the game kind of thing, and then as redeemable later for like real gold and silver. It's cool. I like it. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Thank you again. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, very uh, much. Yeah, and looking forward to checking out uh, reading through that doc when when things slow down a little bit for me. Sure. And thank you for the link. Uh, okay, well, the glad to thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. I, I'll let you know. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Yeah, thanks for that. Bye. <laughs> thanks, guys. All right. Okay, bye, bye then, all the best. Bye, bye. bye.